Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this episode we're taking a diversionary look at 10 myths about the classics and I hope that this video will prove to be a pleasant diversion, give you a wry smile with some of the rebuttals and of course possibly some trivia along the way. So without further ado let's dig in shall we? The first myth about classic literature is one that has really taken deep root in the popular imagination and you may have said it yourself because it sounds so obvious and it's this. Classic authors, because they were paid by the word, used to write very big long books full of description, full of long sentences and extraneous words of flotsam and jetsam of verbiage because they were getting paid for it. That couldn't be further from the truth. Think about it. Why do magazines pay authors to write a novel in serial form? It's to sell their product. Now if that novel was then protracted through great long sentences, stuffing it full of every word from the thesaurus that the, the author could lay their hands on, how many people would finish reading that novel? Or would they give up and buy a different magazine? This is consumerism 101. No, paid by the word is not the reason books are long. I'm going to use two examples to tell you why people read long books or books with extensive description normally. The first one, probably the best example, is Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You know the story from Disney, wonderful thing, The Bells of Notre Dame. This book is absolutely jammed full of description. I'm talking really, really detailed about the architecture that goes on in Paris. The first like five pages are just an overshot of Paris itself. Now to the modern reader that may feel a bit <laughs> wearying, but he didn't do it because he was paid by the word. He did it for ver two very specific reasons. One, people couldn't travel much back then. And so to get a broad sweep, detailed explanation of Paris is like us watching a documentary. People wanted to be able to get the most vivid impression in their mind of the great city of Europe at the time, the greatest city of Europe. On top of that, Hugo himself had a reason for writing this book. At the time in Paris, a lot of the old medieval buildings were being torn down to make way for new buildings, a great resurgence in um, architecture in which we still see in Paris today, beautiful, but they were getting rid of the past. Hugo decided he would write and place buildings from Paris and describe the way they're, you know, they're, they're developed, the way they're built, the ornamentation, the gargoyles, everything about it so that people could see the beauty that was actually being removed in order to make what was new. And it succeeded. People stopped pulling things down. Um, they still built, but they kept up some of the great old works. That was the reason for so much of the description in here, to help people become truly mesmerized about what they were actually going to be getting rid of. And he preserved history through it. Another example of the public not putting up with large books for the sake of it would be the Pickwick Papers. Early on, this began to lose readership in the magazine it was being printed in until Dickens took another turn and introduced Sam Weller, the Cockney. Um, but why, the, why is the book so big? Why do people put up? Because in the Pickwick Papers, they travel through England. This was a way for people to see outside of London. This was a way for people to meet other characters with other dialects, other places and societal habits and norms. People enjoyed learning about others. So myth number one is that authors wrote long books because they were paid by the word and it was just to make money. No, they wrote books people wanted to read and if people didn't want to read them, guess what? That author never got employed again. The second myth about classic books tickles me somewhat, and that is that the classics are all unreadable tosh and ancient relics. You know, they're full of hard words and convoluted sentences and over long-winded descriptions, and the only reason people read classics is to look intelligent when they're not. They're posers. Well, is that true? Let me show you a classic. Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. I would hardly call this unreadable. I would hardly call it difficult. Um, and a struggle. So uh, need I say more, really? You could add loads to this, Swallows and Amazons, Treasure Island. But some people say, ah, oh, yeah, but you're picking kids' books. It's still a classic. 
The problem is maybe how we view classics sometimes. But what about some other extremely readable books? Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. What about Frank Herbert's Dune, which has sold millions of books because it's thoroughly entertaining and very, very readable. It's still a classic. Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Sherlock Holmes, still the best detective fiction you will ever lay your hands on. A doddle to read. Charles Dickens, David Copperfield we've got here, an eminently readable and amusing book. Yes, you may be put off by its sheer bulk. I mean, this is, yeah, that's quite a way to get through. But if it's because it's a long read, that doesn't mean it's unreadable and, and a relic which we needn't pay attention to. Some other things about that argument, when we talk about using difficult words in classic books, whose fault really is that? If we don't understand the words, it's not the author's fault, it's that we today have maybe become rather sludgy in the brain when it comes to our vocabulary, becoming rather utilitarian and, well, you know what I mean, is a sentence I particularly hate. Use colour. That's one of the reasons the classics have lasted, is because they're not unreadable, they are vivid, but they do take a little bit of patience to get through, which in a world of memes is in short supply. The third myth about classic books is a strange one, that classics were all written by wealthy, privileged white men who didn't care less about anybody else and just wrote books for each other. This is gaining traction, would you believe, more among the younger population. Um, and it's so devoid of any evidence as to be almost willfully ignorant. So, let's consider um, who wrote some classic books. Let's think of some people who didn't have a particularly privileged and certainly not wealthy and weren't aristocratic backgrounds. So, Charles Dickens. In poverty, the boy worked at a boot blacking factory, could be beaten, could have been left to starve in the streets. William Shakespeare, no education, worked as a, it didn't go to university, worked as a player and playwright in London. That is not a high ranking job. And yet look what he wrote. Jack London, you know, Call of the Wild, White Fang born into poverty. Emily Dickinson, you know, comes from a very rough upbringing. Uh, what's his name? Mark Twain. Mark Twain's a great example of someone that didn't have a great... Did he leave school like after elementary school? Co goes on to become one of the great writers of, of history. There's so many others that I could add onto this list. You know, you might say, oh yeah, but they're all men that you've just mentioned. Okay, let's talk about women. Anne Bronte. Emily Bronte, um, actually I mentioned Emily Dickinson, so it wasn't all men, Charlotte Bronte, Jane Austen, you know, none of those had a wealthy background and had any particular standing in society. What about um, Catherine Ainsworth? What about Margaret Oliphant, who started with nothing and continued to write because she needed to support a massive family and other members of the further family? Um, Wiener as well. Rhoda Broughton, what about her? None of these people came from any kind of particular strong background. In fact, most of them came from the working class or the lower middle class. They didn't have privilege and many, many, many of them didn't have any kind of education. In fact, most people today have better access to education than these writers did. The fourth myth about classic books is linked to the previous one, which is that Classics are all based on Western egoism and it's about propounding Western literature throughout the whole world. Again, this shows the tendency toward broad brushstroke thinking, which a reading of the classics would help people get rid of. Dostoevsky said that life tends to spread towards divergence rather than making clever aphorisms which hold everybody in some kind of stereotype. So just think of books which are classics which they're not Western. I mean, the big one would be the Bible. It's not a Western book. It was written in Palestine. The Quran, you know, one of the most influential books in the world. How about uh, the Bhagavad Gita? How about Arabian Nights? How about Popol Vuh, which is from the Mayan people? I think it's the Kiche, uh, I think is how you pronounce it. The Dreams um, of the Red Chamber. Which has... The Tale of Genji is arguably the first novel ever written. It's like a thousand years old and it comes from over there in Japan. Pedro Paramo by Juan Rolfo is Mexican. You have Silence by Shusaku Endo. You have The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. 
You have the Turkish classic by Orhan Pamuk, My Name is Red. You have the Makioka Sisters by Junichiro. The Joys of Motherhood by the Nigerian Buchi Emicheta. Speaking of Nigerian classics, Death and the King's Horseman. Chinua Anichibi's Things Fall Apart. What about the work of Camus, especially The Plague, which is set in Algeria and he is Algerian? And that was just scratching the surface. I think the problem here is that people think classics are all books that are old and from Europe. Well, if you say that, then don't be upset if you've got old European books in that. <laughs> I think the problem with this myth is that people who have probably not read many classics just think that all classics are old European books. Well, if that were true, then it would be a truism that all classics are old and European. But I've put a list out here of just non-white authors to set this straight. And this isn't even an exhaustive list. I stopped after a while. So we've got Frederick Douglass from the United States. You've got Phyllis Wheatley, um, Mary Prince, ha Harriet Ann Jacobs, Jose Rizal um, from the Philippines, by the way. Uh, Rab um, Rabindranath Tagore, probably the greatest Indian author and classics. Martin Delaney. Now here's a surprising one. Alexander Pushkin. Did you know that Alexander Pushkin is like Russia's poet, the great poet of Russia, and yet he has African descent through his great-grandfather? Juan Francisco Manzona, Bankrim Chanda Chattabrahai, George Washington Cable, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Sarajini Naidu, Indian writer, Toru Dutt, Henry Asawatana, uh, Zikala Sa, also goes by the name of Gertrude Bonin, um, Oloda Aquino, Nigerian writer, of course, very influential in the abolitionist movement. I'm going to stop. And I stopped. I mean, there's more on that list. And I stopped short. There are so many classic authors who are not white, not male, not from a privileged background, not educated, and not from Europe. It's just so many. So the whole argument, the whole myth about it being, you know, the classics all being by white people is absolute tosh. It is true that there is a greater amount of classics from Europe, but that's for another video. There is a very simple reason for that, but it's not at all linked to the, the myth that people believe. Fifth myth about classics, if that is the number we're on now, I think so, is that the classics are all boring. You know, they are the ultimate cure for insomnia. They're a pure drudge, whatever it may be. Well, again, this is manifestly untrue. And when people say this, if you don't particularly like a style of classic book, that's fine. I'm not saying anyone should have to like the classics, but to sweep away all books and say they're all boring <laughs> is a different matter altogether. So are they boring? Well, if I were to bring up, for instance, I mentioned Treasure Island earlier. Not many kids or dads or granddads can read that book without getting the urge to run to the nearest coastline and jump on a sail ship. Um, how about Count of Monte Cristo? Phenomenally exciting story of revenge and daring do. The Three Musketeers, same author. What a brilliant swashbuckling um, adventure. You've got uh, Captain Blood, I've mentioned him before, by Raphael Sabatini, but also Scaramouche, if you like Sabatini's works. Then there's the Scarlet Pimpernel. I'm just picking the sort of the action ones. Moonstone is a detective work. Sherlock Holmes, another detective work. Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens, thoroughly exciting. And that's not even touching the really moving love stories that are there. And the other ones that um, take you on adventures like King Solomon's Mines, for instance, and your classic murder mysteries by um, Agatha Christie, then there were none, scared me to death. Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, the sense of ominous um, lurking in the background is just terrific to put yourself through. So I would say anyone that says the classics are boring, hasn't read many classics, or they're making a very general sweep of maybe the classics that make you think. But that in itself doesn't say anything about the classics than it does about the person reading them or judging them. Because, you know, a lot of people like to be stretched mentally. I'm not very good with lifting 
heavy blocks and stuff. You know, I'm not very strong, but I've got a friend. You can barely pass a log without them getting the urge to raise it over their head um, and hurl it somewhere because they love doing that. And a lot of people who have read books, modern books, contemporary books, literary fiction, they love to be taken through ideas that test them and push them and they find great joy from it. If you don't like that, that is 100% fine. But to say the classics are boring um, is just a terrible, terrible sweeping statement since it's the classics that are the ones that are repeatedly put into films. And um, I would guess that some of the idea about boring is because there's not enough, um, maybe, sex and explosions and car chases. You know, that would have made Shakespeare much more acceptable today. If there was a few more car chases and, and you know, high explosions, nuclear bombs hidden under buildings in London, that would have really made Shakespeare great, wouldn't it? <laughs> you can't blame him for not having it, though. The sixth myth about the classics is that they're not relevant. They're written ages ago and they have no bearing on our life today, so what's the point in reading them all? This is such a terrible lie because it just demonstrates more the surface level reasoning that goes into making that assumption. You know, we mentioned there's no car crashes or chases in Shakespeare. We have cars today, we can fly, we can do travel, we have the internet, therefore we're totally different from the past. Here's the thing, human beings have not changed. And actually in the fast pace of our world, the pausing to really think through what it means to be human is probably not as great as times gone by when you have more time to think. I'll give you an example of how relevant um, the, the classics are. Let's use Romeo and Juliet, okay? This, this terrific, and people will roll their eyes because maybe they were forced to do it at school, which I don't think is necessarily the right way. I don't blame you for thinking the classics are boring then. Um, but Romeo and Juliet, it's so relevant. It grasps what true love is better than anything that went before it, really, um, and is so powerful that it is repeatedly played out again and again. Shakespeare's plays are constantly redone, but in modern settings, because the characters, the human emotion has not changed, but neither has it been captured so well as Shakespeare managed to put it. People loved Titanic, okay? Oh, I know some people hated it, um, but it was a, a box office hit and people still love it and all that kind of stuff. Titanic is Romeo and Juliet, on a boat. Now, some might say, yeah, no, no, because the Titanic actually sunk. Oh, I'll have you know, so it is modern. It's not, yeah, the Titanic sunk, but Jack and Rose didn't. Jack and Rose is Romeo and Juliet. Why are they called Jack and Rose? J-R. What about Romeo and Juliet? R-J. It's just an inversion of the sexes there. It is the same story. It was told so perfectly well by Shakespeare that that story is still at the crux of pretty much every love story you read in modern literature today. Shakespeare worked it out, but he said it way better. Now, granted, more difficult language, but not as hard as you may think. Just compare Hamlet, for instance, to what we might say today and see whether the language used and the thought that goes into Hamlet is, for argument's sake, superior, right? To be or not to be, whether it is nobler in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by doing so, end them, uh, by opposing, end them. Right, now I didn't give that with much pizzazz, but those words, if today, what would you say? Oh, you know, you gotta choose whether you're gonna live your life or you're not, you know, you can, you could sort of just sit back and there's no point, let's take it. Or you can really strive and make your life mean something. Which one has really got the nobility of the human in it? It's the one to be or not to be. Should I do this or shouldn't I? Should I just suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune because what chance have I got against them? Or should I take arms against the sea of troubles? You know, running, wading into the sea, all that weight and by opposing, beat, defeat them. I mean, that is tremendous writing. It's tremendous lyricism. It infects the mind. And it applies to every human being the thousands of years before Shakespeare, let alone the hundreds of years after Shakespeare. So the idea that the classics are irrelevant is 
really wrong. All that says is people judge things by surface value. Because we have different technology and a little bit of a different language, we are therefore different as humans. No, we are not. And the classics have lasted because they've spoken to all humans in the ages since them. A seventh myth about classics is that the movies are better than the books themselves. Now, I do understand some people say, oh, the movies are never better than the book. I wouldn't say that's always the case. I have enjoyed some of the movies more than books. But it is overall a myth, isn't it? Um, if anyone says that, normally, normally, they haven't read the book. Um, or it's a case of you read a classic book and because it is a bit more high on description and introspection and it's character driven rather than plot driven, which demands more attention and patience than just watching the plot. In a film, it is always turned into a plot. Something the film can't ever give you properly that a book can is the inner dilemmas, the inner workings of the character. In a book, you are forced to possess the character's persona, to think as they think, see as they see. In a film, you can never quite get that without a voiceover of what they're thinking, and that would become too tiresome. In a film, it's always translated by a director into a plot which you can follow. You're invested in the character, but you never are the character. And that's why classic books are better in book form than in film. Also, I love watching the films, by the way. I love watching the films. And they are much easier to watch. I adore them. Some of them, when you've read the book, you are incensed because they're nothing like the, the book themselves, you know, because, of course, we can trust Hollywood to always stick exactly to the script, can't we? Um, but I think a lot of what that comes down to is, is our own... It says something more about our culture that we don't have as much patience anymore. And that's not... That's not a criticism necessarily, it's not good, but we are in a very fast-paced, stressful world, and you know, the leisure to stop and think when we just want some refreshment maybe is a bit harder. But to say that the, the movies are better than the books, no, that's a myth. I think we're on the eighth myth now, I'm sorry I've lost count, but this one is that classic books are morally bankrupt, or worse, they're immoral. They hold to ideas which are outmoded, outdated, and absolutely obscene. Right, so, are there things in the past which are obscene? I don't want to get into this social thing, but of course there are. There's terrible habits of every single culture. Today, we have a culture which future cultures are going to think is absolutely obscene. But at the moment, we don't think we are. We think we're at the very, you know, apex of morality. But it's not true. And also to say that the classics are morally bankrupt, I mean, that's a bit rich coming from a society who takes its morals and ethics from Twitter. Um, and shorts and TikTok, you know, it's a bit, we, actually that, that would raise the question as to how much one knows about the morality and the ethics from personal reading of the classics rather than hearing some soundbite from someone who you think they must have it right and I'll adopt that and believe it's true and then I'll sound all superior. It's not how it is. So if you look back, obviously the classics are built within their culture. They will always be product of their culture. But do you know, it was the classic authors who were behind most of the movements that have achieved the freedoms that are around today. Now, there were some who were against them, but strikingly enough, the classics that endure are the most humane. There's old books, but that doesn't make them classics. The classics are the ones that endure and keep speaking to people. And so you look at the abolitionist movement, Many novels are written sympathetic towards that. The biggest selling novel of the 19th century was um, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, what about social inequities? Dickens spent his life dealing with those things. Zola deals with those things as well. Hardy deals with those things. There's so many people deal with them. And it's that bringing it and putting, formulating words and ideas and uh, stories that people can perceive that moves, puts so much weight, moral weight, to change matters. You know, you talk about um, the role of women in society. 
that's brought up in classic literature and how more needs to be given to women. But also you have to remember it wasn't that long before the universal suffrage that male suffrage got through in Britain. Um, some think it is like all men have always been able to vote in Britain going back to time immemorial. It wasn't. It was, towards, it was only towards the latter end of the 19th century that all men were permitted to vote. Where did that come from? Books. Lots of novels, the classics, and the classics in actual pamphlets and argumentation and dissertations, they're involved as well. So actually the classics, they do contain settings or scenes which today we might find objectionable. For instance, the woman stays at home and deals with the kids and the man goes out. But don't judge a book by today. Back then, if they had had in the novel a load of women going to work and all the men staying at home, no one would have read it because it wouldn't have been believable to their day. You can't blame an author for writing what their world is of the day. Investigate it, and there's hardly anywhere near the oppression that people think there is in the classics. The, the classics are all about how humans deal with each other and overridingly how good humanity is and how much people love one another, especially in families. And those who break those ideals are always the villains in classic literature. So to say classics are completely immoral or, or morally moribund is a myth that's propounded by people who probably haven't read many of the classics, or at least not carefully. The next one is not so much a myth as a diabolical accusation to those who decide to read the classics. And it is that the classics are only read by elitist people who want to imagine themselves more intellectually superior to others. That's rubbish. Most people who read the classics um, don't think they're intellectually superior. It's one of the reasons they're reading them, is to develop themselves and get a better understanding. Classics are not about intellectualism. They were written first and foremost for entertainment. It was the popular masses that read the classics. The reason they've lasted is they were so good that succeeding generations also read them and thought, these are amazing, and they proliferate. And it, again, and again, and again. So when you go to the classics, all it's saying is, these are the books that have been held as being really good for a long time. <laughs> What's wrong reading that? I mean, to say otherwise is almost to say, you know, if you decide to read anything outside of pop culture, you're, you know, terrible, and you're arrogant, and you're pompous. But actually, that statement is arrogant and elitist and pompous. Also, it's like saying, you know, intellectual curiosity. We all know it's going to destroy our fun, so stop reading the classics. It's not how it is. Not at all. Reading the classics is not an elitist activity. I've had comments in my channel about being a snob, because I happen to make the comment about classics depend upon taste. That's not a snobbish comment. First, you have to understand, or there's a presumption there about what is meant by taste. And I'll have to do a whole new video on that because taste is a real thing, but it doesn't mean to say you're better than somebody else, nor does it say you shouldn't read one book um, and you should read another. Always read what you enjoy and what you, you know, and, and to expand your horizons. But there's a reason certain classics have lasted. That's not snobbery. That's just true, isn't it? Have certain books lasted hundreds of years? Yes. Are they still enjoyed even now? Yes. There you go. It's just a fact. It's not intellectual snobbery to read classics. It's actually, I haven't got much time, so I want to make sure that what I read has already been verified by millions to be a good book. And that actually give, means you're going to get a good chance of reading a good book. Now, just before we wrap up, let me just tell you that I have opened a new channel called Tristan Talks Books, and that's where I talk about contemporary literature, modern literature. We're going to be looking at bestsellers, and we may even be diving into some real one-star reviewed books on Goodreads and seeing if they're really as bad as people say, and if the bestsellers are really as good as people say, and we'll have a giggle along the way. Go over there right now and make sure to follow, because there's some good stuff coming up over there. So this is the whole um, end of the 10 myths. I hope it was 10. I've, I seem to have derailed myself. I don't know how many we did. It's probably less. Um, myths about the classics. How would you respond to those challenges? And whatever people say in the comments, please take every comment in good faith that it's said with the most positive of tones, the most polite um, motives, um, because I did get one email, which I've lost. I wanted to reply. And if you're watching, this is to you. Um, 
someone put a comment and others dived on it and took it in a negative way and they really got hit hard by some negative personal comments so they removed their comment from below. Um, I know you may sometimes do that maybe to protect me or whatever. Let's assume the best of one another. And if anyone wants to be really vitriolic and hateful, just leave the comment hanging. That's fine. That's what I do. I just don't, don't engage in it. So uh, anyway, until the next time, or make sure you hit subscribe and ring the bell. Um, until the next time, I wish you joy in whatever you are reading.